the American movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and the German movie The Requiem, each base their story in part on the life of An Annalise Mikkel. This is an attempt to summarize the true story of Annalise Mikkel. The story begins in Leifling, Germany, where Annalise was born on September 21, 1952, to Joseph and Anna Mikkel. After Annalise came three sisters, Gertrude, Barbara, and Roswitha. An older sister, Martha, born in 1950, died of a kidney ailment in 1958. Joseph owned and operated a successful sawmill business in Klingenberg, while Anna kept busy in their office. Annalise's deeply religious grandmother often looked after the children and helped educate them in their Catholic faith. Annalise suffered various childhood diseases, including mumps, measles, and scarlet fever. As a result, she was held back a year in school. She was a good student and hoped one day to become a school teacher. She played the piano and accordion. Joseph and Anna were strict parents and took their Catholic faith seriously. They regularly attended Mass and prayed the rosary together. In September 1968, an unexpected change occurred in Annalise's life. After a brief blackout in the afternoon, later that evening while asleep, Annalise suffered symptoms like an epileptic seizure. She labored to breathe, her arms became stiff, her tongue was as if paralyzed, and she wet her bed. She recovered and all seemed well until about one year later, when a similar attack occurred. A visit to a neurologist showed no abnormal brain activity on an EEG, while the symptoms described suggested grand mal epilepsy. Annalise was quite ill at this time. Her tonsils were removed, and she subsequently contracted pleurisy and pneumonia. In February 1970, she was moved to a hospital in Middleburg, which specialized in bronchial and lung disease. There, she was diagnosed with heart and circulatory problems. Her roommate at the hospital later described Annalise as a happy and religious person, with a positive outlook on life. Annalise never discussed her illnesses. A third attack occurred in June 1970. Annalise was finally released from the hospital in August 1970. Her family and friends noticed a marked change in her. She was quiet and withdrawn. Annalise would later describe to a neurologist and a psychologist some of her experiences while in the hospital. She stated that she saw ghastly, demonic faces, was left her terrified and depressed. She also experienced terrible stenches described as being like burning fecal matter, which she only experienced in the beginning. Visits to several physicians continued. After an attack in June 1972, a visit to a neurologist resulted in the drug Dilantin being prescribed. Dilantin is prescribed primarily to treat grand mal epilepsy and psychomotor seizures. Often Annalise's body became stiff and she would have brief absences or blackouts. She continued to experience the demonic faces, absences, and terrible stenches while on Dilantin. In early 1973, Annalise complained of hearing rapping noises inside her closet, under the floor, and above the ceiling. On one occasion, Anna found Annalise in their living room, in front of a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, her face full of hatred, and her eyes jet black. In the fall of 1973, Annalise described to a psychologist how she was apathetic, and her depressed state left her with thoughts of suicide. Around this time, Annalise visited her neurologist, who suggested consulting a Jesuit. Annalise's father felt that a pilgrimage to the Marian Shrine at San Damiano, Italy, might be good for Annalise. When Annalise arrived at the shrine, she could not enter as she said her feet were burning. She described to Thea Hine, who led the pilgrimage, that she could not drink the holy water or look at sacramentals or holy pictures. During the pilgrimage, Annalise grabbed Thea and broke a medal that Thea was wearing around her neck. Annalise also exuded a horrible stench like fecal matter, which everyone could smell. In spite of the trip to San Damiano and Annalise's totally uncharacteristic behavior, Annalise and Thea became friends. Thea stated that she began to pray for Annalise. Annalise later told Thea that she knew when Thea was praying for her. Thea noted what Annalise said and verified what she had said was true. Thea also said that Annalise stated, among other things, that Jesus told her that there would come a time when the whole world would talk about hell and the devil. Several priests were sought for, for advice. Thea contacted Father Adolf Rudwick, well known for his expertise in possession and exorcism. 
he had written several books on the topic. He requested a written account of the trip to San Damiano. Although there were possible signs of possession, he said that he could not get involved due to his advanced age and the fact that he resided in Frankfurt. Father Ernst Alt and Father Karl Roth, along with several other priests, had on occasion met to discuss Annalise's condition. Several weeks before Father Alt met Annalise, two letters were hand-delivered to him, one written by Annalise and one written by Anna. Upon physically receiving these letters, Father Alt had an experience unlike never before. He became nauseated and overcome by a strange excitation and distress feeling. Later that evening he had trouble saying Mass and experienced an intense stench as though something was burning. Prayer brought little relief. It was not until five the following morning that it was over. The following evening when Father Ralt discussed what had happened, the night before with several of his priest friends, they suddenly all experienced a horrible stench. About two weeks before Father Ralt met Annalise for the first time, he described her as modern, devout, intelligent, and honest. In the fall of 1973, Annalise began her university studies in Würzburg. She was majoring in education, music, and theology. Father Alt visited her regularly. She felt depressed as the demonic faces continued to haunt her. In November she met a fellow education student by the name of Peter. They began to see a lot of each other. Annalise described her condition to Peter in December of 1973. She stated that at times she had no control over things. Depression coincided with the demonic faces and stenches. Also at this time, Annalise visited a neurologist and a psychologist in Würzburg. The psychologist felt Annalise suffered from a neurosis caused by a domineering father and hatred for her mother. He suggested epilepsy as the cause of her seizures. The neurologist switched her from Dilantin to Tegretol, as the Dilantin had not completely suppressed what he surmised was epilepsy. When she met Father Alt in March of 1974, she said that at times she was unable to pray. Father Alt continued to pray over and for her. Annalise always felt better after Father Alt's visits. Father Alt felt that there were many things which Annalise was experiencing physically and spiritually, which could not be explained by epilepsy. Various letters written by Annalise to Father Alt provided insight into Annalise's condition. She felt that she had no control, which left her depressed. At times she felt like she was in a trance. Other times she experienced an aversion to confession, which felt extreme, and she was unable to receive communion.
One minute she could be her normal self, while the next she would be, could be wild. After a week, Anne Lees returned to Klingenberg. She slept very little and was, un was unable to eat. Eventually, when she could eat a little, she could not keep the food down. Around this time she became emaciated and her eyes were black and blue. She often injured herself. At times she was constrained to min minimize her injuries. On May 28, 1976, after praying to Rosie with her family, she must have strength to sign the papers for her thesis. On May 30th, a friend of Father Alt, Dr. Richard Roth, a physician from Klingeberg, came to witness one of the exorcism sessions. Dr. Roth had previously listened to some of the exorcism tapes and told Father Alt that listening to the tapes inspired him to pray again. Dr. Roth was curious to witness the events firsthand, and Father Alt was happy to have a doctor present as Anne Lees's physical condition had worsened. Upon seeing Anne Lees, Dr. Roth explained, My God, she has the stigmata. He also stated, There is no injection against the devil. Father Alt came again for the session of June 8th. It was the last time he was to see Annalise alive. In a letter to the bishop he described Annalise's self-inflicted injuries and how she had bitten a hole in the wall and chipped her teeth. Father Renz continued with exorcism sessions until the end of June. Father Renz also reported to the bishop and described some of Annalise's injuries and how she at times made countless genuflections. She was quite emaciated and ate or drank little. Annalise had stated repeatedly that she would gladly eat if she was allowed to. Amidst the pain and terror, there were times when Annalise spoke normally with Peter and her family. Peter stated that Annalise was always absolutely clear in her decisions. The topics most frequently discussed were should they seek medical help and the hope that it would all be over in July. On June 27th, Ann Lees had a, figure of close, a fever of close to 40 degrees Celsius. This was brought down by cold compresses. Joseph called Father Alt, which suggested calling a doctor. When Roswitha asked Ann Lees, she refused. The following day, she neither ate nor drank. On June 30th, 1976, Father Renz, Joseph, Anna, Roswitha, Barbara, and Peter were present. Ann Lees's temperature was again over 39 degrees. She suddenly begged, Please, absolution. Father Renz immediately gave her absolution. Peter and Joseph held Annalise, and Anna used a pillow to soften the effects of repeated genuflections that Annalise insisted on making. Finally, when it was over, Peter and Father Renz said good night, while Annalise asked her mother to stay. Her final words were, Mama, please stay with me, I am afraid. At 8 a.m. the next morning, Anna called Joseph to tell him that Annalise was dead. No one had ever imagined that the outcome on July 1, 1976, could be as transpired. She was now free. Anna called Father Alt, who immediately called Dr. Roth. Dr. Roth estimated the time of death to be around 6 a.m. Since Dr. Roth did not have the proper papers for a death certificate, Dr. Keller was called. He did not issue a death certificate as he could not state that Annalise's death was due to natural causes. A post-mortem showed that cause of death was due to starvation with physical exhaustion as a possible contributing factor. A criminal investigation began. The story received considerable attention by the media. Some came to visit Annalise's grave and pray the rosary. On July 13, 1977, Father Renz, Father Alt, and Joseph and Anna were notified that they were going to be charged with negligent homicide for failing to seek medical assistance for Annalise. The trial began on March 30, 1978 in Aschaffenburg. One newspaper stated that not since the Nuremberg trials had a story generated so much commentary. Public opinion was for the most part formed by a hostile media which was not open to the possibility of possession and did not have any idea of what the family, friends, and the two priests actually witnessed and experienced in this case. The court was to decide what caused Annalise's death and who was responsible. The judge stated that citizens had violated the law, that it was neglect in the sense or off under the law. 
The McKells did not testify. Father Alt, who was forty, gave most of the testimony, being the younger of the two priests. Father Alt stated that Anne Lees viewed her sufferings as penance for priests and the German youth. Anne Lees wanted the tapes made public so that people would realize that there was a devil and that the spiritual world did exist. If Anne Lees's illness had been a physical one, he and Father Renz would have sought medical help. He spoke of the various demons whom they recognized by their different tones and expressions. Annelise did not eat, due to the influence the demons had on her. Dr. Luthi testified that he had never suggested consulting the Jesuit, contrary to what the Macelles witnessed. Dr. Roth, whom the defense felt would be of benefit to them, testified on three occasions. He never seemed to remember anything. Father Alt stated that Dr. Roth made several statements which were simply not true. Dr. Roth was investigated for perjuries, but no charges were laid. Father Renz presented excerpts of the exorcism tapes and explained how they came to believe that Anne Lee suffered from possession, and that no one ever died a result of an exorcism. Father Roderick testified that he was absolutely convinced that Anne Lee was possessed, and that she was without a will while this state lasted, and that she was entirely normal when the state was not present. On behalf of the prosecution, Dr. Sattis gave a summary of Anne Lee's medical history. Sattis stated that Dilantin successfully suppressed the seizures, resulting in the disease seeking another outlet, being a psychogenic psychosis. Sattis saw in Anne Lee's a psychogenic posture, where she assumed the role of a person dominated by one or more demons. He also believed that Anne Lee suffered from delusional ideas about being sinful and from hallucinations of the devil. This was common among religious people who suffer from depression, he said. The exorcism sessions confirmed her psycho psychotic attitudes and made things worse. Up until April the priest could have saved her by convincing her to eat, whereas by June it was too late. Satis stated that he would have tranquilized Annalise, force-fed her, and treated her with electric shock. In her book, The Exorcism of Annelise Michel, Dr. Felic Felicitas Goodman points out various errors presented by Satis in his testimony. Her book is arguably the best on this story, as she had access to the priests, the court documents, and written testimony from several of the witnesses to the exorcism sessions. The two psychiatrists brought to the trial by the defense, in effect, supported Satis' evaluation of Annelise by their testimony much to the defense's disappointment. They believed that the two priests acted out of religious conviction, albeit from a naive and primitive perspective. The priests leaned towards a magical, mystical view, which was unusual for theologians of our time. They felt that Annalise's demons were the expression of her naive piety. Her personality was determined by her epilepsy. This developed into a schizophrenic-like psychosis, or psychogenic psychosis with depressive and delusional disturbances. The prosecution asked that the four be found guilty of negligent homicide due to their failure to act. They asked for fines for the priests and no punishment for the parents as they had suffered enough. The defense demanded an acquittal and as Annalise had placed her life in God's hands and it was her moral and constitutional right to refuse medical attention. The judges accepted the prosecution's medical testimony in its entirety. The epilepsy had evolved into a psychosis. In May, Anne Lees was unable to determine what was in her best interests. The exorcisms aggravated her condition. The defendants should have sought medical help. All four were sentenced to six months in prison, which was suspended with three years probation. The two priests were fined, and the four incurred court costs. Later in a BBC interview, Anne Lee's boyfriend Peter stated, We were really hoping in her statement, on July 1st there will come a change. Of course that things would happen as they did, we would never have imagined. This is the case when dealing with the new supernatural. From Anne Lee's diary or spiritual notes, You will pass all your tests, but you will be called upon to undergo tests of a different kind. I will give you my grace. You will be faithful till death.